bugging, heartless and mean, mugging at 16 on the scene, watching beans, bugging, kicking up dust with the older G, soaking up the game that was told to me. Hey, what's up, family? I'm gonna be talking to Bob, my first time going to the shoe. So I had just been given a 15 month shoe term when I was 17 years old. And a shoe term is a security housing unit. It's where when we catch a 115, A1 offense, division B, division D, C's, whatever. An A1 offense is the, is the highest um, 115 that you can get. It comes with the point system. I don't really remember the exact points that you're getting, but for instance, let's say uh, you stab someone, you're gonna get 15 points and you're gonna get it doubled up. So you're gonna end up getting 30 points or 40 or 50 points for stabbing. That jacks up your point system and that's where you find yourself in level fours. Uh, if you're coming from the shoe, you're gonna to go to a 180 yard, depending on your point system. A 180 yard is a, a level four that's broken up into three parts. A section, cut off with a side door. B section cut off between A section and C section with two side doors. It's just more controlled. Now, for a 15 month shoot term, you're gonna do 11 months out of that shoot term because it's your first shoot term. I mean, that's, that, that, that's how it works. You go before a senior hearing officer, SHO, which is usually the lieutenant, and the lieutenant is um, under the color of state law and he's the one that adjudicates um, whether or not whether the findings of guilt meet the preponderance of evidence Meaning they need some evidence to say that you're guilty of doing this But for me in particular I had to do uh, I got a 15 month shoot term and I did 11 months out of that shoot term within the first three months of my um, My shoot term because even though you're waiting adjudication in the hole You have to go through a process you have to go before a committee you have to go before a captain Well, you go before the captain and you go before the SHO and then then you go before the committee. The committee um, compounded what the SHO's finding of guilt was. And so because of that, they gave me a 15 month shoot term. Because that was my first shoot term, they, because that was my first shoot term, they sent me to a um, Corcoran shoot. So uh, I waited for the bus. Once the bus came, they packed the whole bus with people that were waiting for uh, shoot terms. And we went to uh, Corcoran State Prison. Corker State Prison was known for its um, gladiator school. The first uh, shoe facility, the first shoe building that I had ever went to. Now there was still shoe there. That facility was all uh, PHU, which is the protective housing unit. In that protective housing unit, you had Charles Manson, you had Sirhan Sirhan, and you had uh, other notoriety uh, um, inmates that couldn't be on uh, GP or PCRs. I don't know, because of contracts on their life or whatever I don't know I don't really know too much about all that but um that's where we would see Charles Manson you know going to his visits getting no escorted while we were at the time they didn't have the cages but anytime we went to the law library to the law library every time that we went to our visiting we were able to see Charles Manson once in a while depending on whether or not he got a visit now it was a trip because we got there like I said at three o'clock in the morning and when I was going in there Damn, I felt like I was going underground. I had mentioned this in a previous video. And for a 17 year old kid, I was like, I was like, it, I just went down there. I felt like I was going underground. They lined us up on the wall. There was a couple, there was a, maybe like seven, eight comps. Um, and then and then all the inmates that were, they were facing us, they were all um, looking outside their windows. Well, it was a, a honeycomb door. So they were all looking out their honeycomb doors. And these were all the, these, these were all the big fellas. And I remember them um, calling my name, uh, 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 not uncuffing me, but uncuffing, uh, uh, taking, a, uh, taking me away from the chain gang and then walking me upstairs. And I was saying, all right, all right, fellas, all right, right. And as I was going upstairs, I went to the corner cell in B section. Um, I, I don't know the, the exact number of cell I was in, but as I went into the cell, and I, you know, I, I stuck my hands through the tray slot so they could remove the cuss from my hands. You know, I looked at my cell and it was all concrete. There wasn't no mattress in there. And uh, um, it dawned on me and I was like, damn, well, what did I just do to myself? What did I just do? Because I felt complete isolation. One, I felt like I was going underground. Second, as soon as I went to, um, my cell, it was all concrete. I was in a rock. 
And you know, it really, really took away from me because I, I vocalized it. I vocalized what I was experiencing, saying, what did I just do to myself? I didn't even have a damn mattress. And um, so they took the cuffs out, I was just walking up and down because you know, the bunks were sideways. So you only had this little walk path. And I was walking up and down fr from the cell, uh, or rather back and forth. And then somebody called me in the vent, which was um, where our, our, um, our air was coming from. And so he said, hey, homie, so I went up, I, I climbed on top of the bunk, and I said, yeah, what's up? And um, it was a, it was an older dude, and he was saying, hey, man, uh, what's your name, where you're from? I told him all that. He said, what you're here for? I explained it to him. And um, he says, well, what do you need? I said, well, I ain't got a mattress. And so it was at that time that he started, when the blockers would walk by for count, he would get him, hey, man, the, the, the homie ain't got a mattress. You gotta, you gotta, gotta give him a mattress. And uh, he got every other homie on board to make sure that I got my mattress, to make sure that I got my pillow, and to make sure that I got my fish kit, you know, uh, a roll with my clothing, um, uh, a bed roll, a, a pair of boxers, a pair of socks, uh, a beat up sheet and a wool blanket. And they, and they were able to give me all that, you know, opening the chase line, passing through the, the blanket that was rolled up with all the stuff that I needed in it, right? I got that. It took me a couple hours to get the mattress, but once I got it, um, you know, you, you got to bed it up. But at the same time, one of the things that, that it, that's policy inside the um, security housing unit is, is that you have to do, you have to make a line. And so we made our line by um, cutting up our boxers. Some of the, the boxers that were made were real easy too. They were PIE industry is uh, boxers that were created. So I mean, you could just tear the linen from side to side, right? You just pull the strings out. And you do it about four different times and the whole elastic would come off. As once the elastic came off, you pull the little strings with the elastic and then you start to unravel the line, unravel the, the, the box string that was holding everything together with the uh, elastic um, string. You have to remove the string. We would, we would you know, uh, tie it from one end to the other, spin it with a bar of soap and we would braid the line so we would, we would create ourselves a fishing line. We had to create our self-efficient line because eventually, which was the morning was to come, and as soon as that came after breakfast, I had to um, shoot my line, which was the line that I had uh, braided through uh, with a, uh, they used to give us jack flaps. And the little jack flap you would sand down and you would fit underneath the door. The door was about this thin, right? So you had to make sure that it was thin enough to slide out the door that was tied out to the line with a little, you know, uh, paper clip uh, on the side of the, um, we call them raflas, which was the car, which was the jet flap. So that it would hook the other line that the homie was trying to fish to you. As he fished it, we threw the car, snatched the line up, pulled his line in, and then we were able to put our 128. Our 120 was our locker porter. Um, and, and what it was seeing, and think about it, it was a locker porter. We had to let them know why we were in administrative segregation, why we had went to ADSEG, which mine said stabbing battery on an inmate with SPI. So, or, or GBI, I think it was GBI, I don't know, one of them. Um, but anyhow, I had to roll it up, tie it on the line, make sure that it went through the little mouse hole, um, and then slide the lane out, slide the line out with the little magazines because the, the, the doors were thin enough that the, the, the wheelas, which were the kites, could get caught. So I had to put out a magazine, slide the car out, right? So what you would think, well, where did you get a magazine, right? Um, when um, the enemies, when a uh, black house would walk, the, the homie that talked to me downstairs, he made sure to give me a, a whole bag full of cosmetics, um, whether it was little small t um, syrup uh, container with uh, toothpaste, shampoo, soap, magazines, paper, um, some pin fillers, uh, pin fillers that he had already rolled up in, in um, state paper so that he could make it thick enough so that we could write with our hands. He made sure that all that stuff was there. And that's how I was able to, uh, um, you know, put out the bridge so that the, the wheel I was wearing gonna get caught. And as I slid it to the homie, anyhow, that's just uh, the simple introduction as in seeing who you are, what you're there for, and then it goes, it, it starts to, uh, and from there you can get put on the roster. The roster in a sense during that time was, um, Gallo, the morning call as far Anyhow, I really met some good people there, even though I was feeling this extreme isolation. Um, it was through their embrace that I was able to 
really feel of the solidarity of what they were going through. And because I felt that it was a, an internal struggle and something that we're all going through, um, we're all there to be together and then unified. Within that unification, I mean, we shared a canteen um, with all the Southerners, with all the Mexicans, with all the whites, with, I mean, Northerners, Blacks, everybody shared in there. Nobody was um, uh, differentiated inside the inside the, the, the unit that we were in unless we were on the group yard. If we were on the group yard, then of course we were getting off each other, except for the whites. And, you know, that's just, that's who we programmed with. And, you know, I don't knock them, them dudes were, you know, they were some vicious dudes, you know. At the same time, so were the Northerners, so were the Blacks and other different factions that were there. But um, it, an overall experience, you know, it was all right because it gave me strength. It made me understand that only through hardship could I succeed. I was given time and uh, ample opportunity to learn. I studied, I studied a lot. I read a lot of books. And I was able to learn how to draw. I got one of my first drawings in the shoe. Um, I'm gonna have to upload it later. I was barely trying to mimic the pin. Um, it's not as good as the stuff that I can do now, but it was my first attempt, right? It was my first attempt at mimicking the art that was produced inside the California prison system. The art that was produced was produced by some of the OGs and dang, I mean, some of these dudes have passed away, but I can tell you this, they were some of the best artists that I've ever, I've ever met or have known or have come across in my entire life. Tragically, some of them have passed away, others are still incarcerated, but it's it's um it's really a a, a tragedy because they have so much potential, so much skill that it's not gonna be recognizable by the world. And that's very unfortunate. Um because even to this day, I can consider a lot of the people in the prison system as better artists than I. But this is how we develop. So I would get their, um, I would get their uh, their copies because a lot of it, a lot of us pass them around, and I would I would receive this copy. I would look at it, and I, I knew that these dudes were creating this art with just a pin. And so I said, "Dang, man, if I can mimic this pin work, this type of shading, and 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 transfer it to another piece, I'm gonna do good in my life." And so I kept practicing and practicing and practicing. And eventually I was able to mimic the paintings because that's what they were, paintings with the ballpoint pen the same way they did it. And as I did that, I knew that my, my skills were enhancing. And it all started when I was 17 years old, learning, educating myself, learning how to play chess, learning different skills when it came to art by simply looking at a piece and mimicking it. I was developing new skills. I was developing social skills, communication skills. To go for my cell, fish to A section, and uh, meet the other homies line from there. And at the same time, to deliver all the kites from C section and B section to A section, and then from A section to B section to C section. This is what I was doing. And so I was learning how to uh, be really skillful while at the same time being mindful that the blackers could walk at any time. See, if the black guys walked at any time and they seen you fishing, the first thing that they're gonna do is they're gonna run for those kites. If they run for those kites and they jack the kites that you're fishing in, there's gonna be some problems. All I knew is I, I had a job to, uh, to function in because I was in that cell and that was a fishing cell. And so every day was an active day. Every day was a busy day. If we weren't fishing, we were mindful that the black guys weren't going to um, interfere with the things that we were doing. So we were keeping point. While also keeping point, we were also working out. We were um, disciplining in our minds, our bodies, our spirits, our, I can't really say our souls. I mean, the soul in the sense of saying we were focused on darkness, but there was no scriptural reading. There was no me focusing on God. There was no me developing my relationship with Jesus. It was always developed. The, the only relationship that was developed was amongst the camaraderie, amongst the solidarity, amongst the people that we were living with. And it was an extreme thing that I got to experience when I was 17 years old. I hate you up, family. Stay tuned for part two, and we're just gonna go down the line. I mean, there's so many different things that were happening. I mean, part two in the sense of seeing what, we were, what I was experiencing on a day-by-day -day basis.